Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'm uh, very happy to take a call on part one of the Holidays Amendment Bill. and I want to focus on an issue that hasn't, as far as I'm aware, been discussed uh, at all, either in the second reading or in the committee stage so far. And yet, as far as employers are concerned, it's probably the single most important change that was made to the 2003 Act and the single most important change to this bill, and that is the issue of relevant daily pay. Now, in 2003, I was the Vice President of the Private uh, Hospitals Association. It was an organisation that represented not only the surgical hospitals, but also a very wide a range of the um, aged care providers in this country. Not uh, the residential villages, retirement villages, but rest time and hospital level care for the elderly. And we were absolutely emphatic about this, as many employers were, regardless of the merits of what was being attempted by the relevant daily pay calculations. The calculation created some serious uh, disincentives. Uh, it was firstly completely um, unworkable from a payroll perspective. It simply was not possible for a payroll system to calculate relevant daily pay for organisations that ran around the clock 24-7, as hospitals and aged care providers did. And where, uh, thanks to collective employment agreements, there were a number of allowances that were being paid for evenings, night shifts and weekends. And the um, possibly unintended but certainly perverse outcome of the relevant daily pay clause as it's presently in the Act was that people, uh, staff were going to be paid more for being sick than they would for being well and at work. It's absolutely true, and I can, if, I, if time allowed, I would give you the numbers, but somebody working a mixture of shifts, uh, who might work an evening shift, the odd weekend shift, the odd night shift, and then was rostered on a day shift, does, according to the Act, is required to be paid a, a relevant daily pay that includes all of the allowances that they had earned um, on those um, swing shifts in the previous four weeks. So somebody that might be on a base rate with no allowances who calls in sick then has to be paid more than that for staying at home. So what did that do to the sick leave provisions? Well, uh, every employee is honourable and I'm sure they don't intend consciously to take uh, sick leave when they weren't sick. But what happened was two things happened. Firstly, sick leave went up. And it went up quite considerably. But what also happened was really interesting. Across the country, this was observed. The pattern of sick leave changed. So whereas there was a usually even distribution between days, nights, weekends, and so on, uh, the sick leave shifted into the day shift, um, where, well, who knows what might be happening, but certainly in terms of the payment for being sick was greater than what would be earned if they had come to work. And that's been the case for seven years. That's been the case for nearly seven years, and it needed to change. It was one of the things that the working group that the Minister set up was charged with um, addressing. It, it was their number one recommendation. And although the Minister and the officials actually worked the solution into the bill in a slightly different way, I think this represents a vast improvement to what we have now. Um, the average daily pay calculations are much more straightforward. They are likely to take out those perverse incentives, at least to some degree. Uh, I actually would offer a view that I think there is a, still a journey that we can take that will merge the annual leave and uh, sick leave and, and alternative day provisions in the future. But this is a huge adva advance compared with where we've got. Now, just in the time available, I also want to touch on the issue of the employee, uh, sorry, the employer determining when an alternative day might be taken. And I just want to offer a story that was given to the select committee of a, of a uh, primary industry company where a whole department of workers who tended to be on the same shift uh, wanted to take annual leave to go to the races. And the employer quite rightly said, look, I can't actually have that. The disruption to the business is too great. And we've got to keep things going. You're a whole shift. We can't, we can't have that. So what did they do? They all took their alternative days and the business had to shut down so that these guys could go to the races. Now, you can draw your own conclusions about whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, but actually someone has to determine it. And when it comes to the running of the business, I'm very comfortable um, that that is the employer.
I call Darian Fenton. Thank you, Mr Chair. Well, um, I'm pleased to take a call in Part 1 of the Holidays Amendment Bill, which is a substantive part of the Bill. It's, got, it's the guts of the Bill, if you like. It's got all of the, the provisions that the Government's um, planning, all, all of the changes that the Government's planning to make to uh, the rights of workers and wage and salary earners in New Zealand um, around their holidays and sick leave. I think... Uh, you know, we don't disagree with everything in the bill, but there are three fundamental things that we do disagree with. And I want to start with the fourth week.